Welcome. I'm Warno Deschalet, and this is A Baha'i Perspective. Welcome to A Baha'i Perspective. I recorded an interview with Gail Matsub on November 2, 2020. Gail is a contemporary fiction writer who has lived in three continents and is fluent in several languages while working in the fields of health care, education, coaching, training, and community development, including NGO work. Her background and experience in multicultural environments, including the intimate settings of Persian family and community, provides her with unique insights into the complex issues she writes about. She's the author of Crimson Inc. and is currently working on its sequel. This story exemplifies her experience in the intimate setting of Persian family and community. We feature the book in the interview. I started the interview by asking Gail where she grew up and what was religious life like growing up. I grew up on the South Shore suburbs of Boston. My family's religious background, my father was Catholic, my mother Protestant, and the whole family was kind of a mix of that. The only outside religion, we had a couple of Jewish kids in town, and that was really it. I had no exposure to anything outside that. What was your spiritual path that led you from that kind of upbringing to being attracted to the Baha'i faith? As a young teenager, I don't know, maybe 13, 14 years old, I went to one of those Christian youth camps, and I found myself very inspired, and I found myself inspired by the Bible. That kind of came and went, but I had this some sense that there was something I was missing, and that I had to write a term paper when I was a senior in high school. During that time, I was looking and researching for it. I came upon what used to be known. I don't know if they still exist. They're called the Harvard Classics. It was, you know, like excerpts of all sort of the great pieces of literature. I found something in there that was from the Quran. And I read this, and when I read it, it, I felt like I had come upon buried treasure, and I thought, oh my gosh, what is this? Because it was all about Jesus and it was about Mary and I don't remember what part of the Quran that was even in. But when I read it, I thought, oh my goodness, this is amazing. And then the next thought was, they've been lying to us. They're saying these people, those were the days, of course, when who knew a Muslim? Nobody did because we're talking about 1968 or something like that. And in this small town, nobody knew anybody, you know, from that persuasion. But we had heard the name Muslim or Mohammedan or something like that. And we'd been told, no, 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 all those people go to hell. You know, we don't talk about Buddhists and, you know, all these other people like that. And so I thought, no, 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 something's up here. And so that got my interest peaked. And I thought, there's something wrong here. Anything that sounds like this can't be wrong. And so that led me on this sort of search which got interrupted because then I went off and I became a student and I, you know, was studying nursing and was in the big city then and all of this other stuff. I got waylaid with that. But then I had, there was a family tragedy and that got me to thinking about some other things. I had a roommate who was a very interesting person and we had a lot of discussions about God and I kept playing devil's advocate and she kept saying, no, 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 there is God and Anyway, we went back and forth for a while with that. Sorry to interrupt. So at that point, you were questioning whether there was a God? I think at that point, I had become agnostic. Mm -hmm. I had become agnostic. I kind of knew there was, but then I, I wasn't sure what to do with it. And so this friend was kind of calling me back to this. But... You know, those were days when there was a lot of skepticism about everything. You know, this was the time of the Vietnam War. There were, you know, the hippie movement, um, lots of things. You know, the Hare Krishna people were dancing in the streets. There were all kinds of things going on. I guess I was very wary about religion in general, like where it was going, even though I knew in my heart 
that there was something there. I could sort of feel my soul, so you know, for lack of a better way of putting it. So we had these conversations, but then I gradually got back into, okay, fine, I'll say, let's get back into, you know, some sort of a religion. All I had was Christianity in front of me. So I went to Bible study groups with different people in my class. That was fine. And then I heard about the Baha'i faith from a friend of mine who was not at school. In fact, it was a guy who was in the military and he was stationed in Texas. And he came back and said, hey, I've heard about this thing called the Baha'i faith. And I said, what's that? And he told me. And we went to a fireside. And then... So what is a fireside, Gail? A fireside. Yeah, that's what I said. Like, what the <laughs> heck is that? And he said, oh, well, you know, we'll just go and you can find out by being there. But basically, we people sit and talk about different things. And there's a conversation among a lot of people. Somebody might present something, a topic, and then people will talk about it. They present it from the perspective of the Baha'is. And I said, but what do you all believe? And are you a Baha'i? And he said, no, but they believe in unity of humankind, and they believe in you know the oneness of God, and they believe in equality, and all of these other nice principles. And I thought, okay, well, that sounds good. Let's go. So we did. I remember nothing about the topic that was talked about that evening. But what I do remember... This had the most profound effect, and I, I still you know, get the same feelings when I remember it and if I talk about it. When I went into that home, which was filled with all these perfect strangers, I didn't know anybody except this friend of mine that I went with, and he didn't know anybody either, and yet we were welcomed with this incredible love, and there was this sense of warmth and inclusion and joy the atmosphere was absolutely the most amazing thing. And I and I said, I finished the evening by saying, I don't know what these people have, but I want it. So that was my first introduction to the Baha'i faith. And then, of course, I went back and I went to more of these types of things. And I asked questions and I got answers. And then I said, can I read something? And then I got some books. People were willing to lend me some books. And then we would have conversations. I continued to play devil's advocate, though, because, again, there were all these other movements out there, and I was concerned about, you know, getting hoodwinked into something. So I questioned sharply. And then I decided to pray. And when I looked at the whole thing and I reflected on it, what I was reading I discovered, you know, this is the stuff that I remember believing forever. That time that I did that high school research paper where I thought, there's something else that we're not being told. Then I, I remembered that and I thought, this is it, that all the religions come from the same source. All the religions are connected. Nobody's in competition with anybody. Well, at least fundamentally so and it's only people that are making a mess out of things if there is a mess you know that was it and then I became a Baha'i shortly after that I'm speaking with Gail Matsub a contemporary fiction writer who's lived in three continents and is fluent in several languages while working in the fields of health care education coaching training and community development including NGO work her background and experience in multicultural environments, including the intimate settings of Persian family and community, provides her with unique insights into the complex issues she writes about. And she's the author of Crimson Ink and is currently working on a sequel. And we're going to be talking about Crimson Ink shortly. But first, Gail, I'd like to ask you, when did writing become a passion for you? You know, some of us are late bloomers. <laughs> <laughs> As long as I can remember, I've liked writing some things. And people used to say, oh, you should write. I would write postcards that would turn into whole books. You know, I would write minuscule print and relate stories on postcards when I was traveling. But I never took it seriously. Because of my professional life and raising kids and living in so many different places and whatnot, I never really got down to it until... Much later, somewhere, 
I was living in Switzerland at the time. It was just about 20 years ago. And I just had this sudden thing come over me, and I don't, I have no idea where it came from. It was like a little voice saying, you need to write. You need to write. And I kept insisting, and I kept saying to myself, well, what do you want to write? I had no clue. I had absolutely no clue. I had some conversations with some people about it, and they encouraged me and so on. And gradually, I tried a little of this, a little of that. I just tried a lot of different things, and it was all nonfiction. It was more to do with things that I was working with, different techniques that had to do with coaching and, you know, sort of human development and that kind of thing. And then I was trying to relate that to spiritual principles and, you know, how to improve lives using different spiritual techniques and and different coaching techniques and and various things like that. And so, in fact, I do have a manuscript for an entire book on that. And then 12 years passed (laughs) and I was in the shower and, and I found that since that time, this happens to me frequently, I was in the shower one night and it was like this very, very clear voice said, you need to write about the situation of the Baha'is in Iran. And you need to do it as a novel, not as a, a nonfiction, you know, sort of documentary type thing. And it was so clear to me that that had to be done. I, it, it just permeated everything. And I came out of the shower and I, I announced this to my husband who looked at me with some surprise. And he said... Well, then do it. (laughs) Just do it. (laughs) I said, but I've never done anything like this before. And he said, it doesn't matter. If you don't do it, you will regret that. And so I said, all right, so fine. And then I got going on it. Before I knew it, I had an entire outline. I had the story in a very basic form. I knew exactly who my character, my lead character was going to be. I knew exactly who some of the other characters would be. I knew who the bad guys were going to be. It was very clear. And so then I embarked on this and it was intermittent because I was working, you know, professionally and whatnot. So this took from start to finish with a lot of times where I would have a hiatus of many months, but it took about seven years. And so this book was not published until about a year ago. I worked very hard on it to get the research right because, yes, it's fiction, but everything had to be completely spot on and provable from the standpoint of the historical context. I've always kind of liked research anyway. I did that when I was studying French literature and, you know, had to do research for work that I was doing with that. I was digging around and trying to find, you know, as as much information as I could. It was always very important to me to get it 100% right and to make sure you have all your sources there. And of course, now we have the internet. And of course, that was invaluable. Many of the sources, I have a whole reference section at the back of the book that shows websites and YouTube videos, everything that you can get all this information on. So you had said that you heard a voice saying you've got to write about the situation of the Baha'is in Iran. Maybe you could, for those who may not be aware, what is that situation of the Baha'is in Iran? The Baha'is, right from the get-go of the Baha'i history, going back to 1844, have not been well received in the land of the faith's birth. They were seen as a threat, even though they were not. And there was a lot of persecution. And there were over 20,000 whose blood was shed and who were driven from their homes and were somewhere exiled and so on and so forth. There was a very bad time. And this has continued to the present day. It still continues. And when the Iranian Revolution took place in 1979, and, and even prior to that, as events that led up to it, the Baha'is became targets because it was, as revolutions are, there is a certain amount of chaos and confusion as regimes transition. And so Baha'is were targeted. And of course, with an incoming regime that was theocratic, 
it was the same old historical enemies, so to speak, of the Baha'is. And they decided this was time to have a field day. And they did. They executed very many people, and they imprisoned even more, tortured them, did I mean, unspeakable things. And that was in the early days of the revolution and through the 1980s. But having said that, they did that to a lot of other people as well. So the Baha'is were in company with any number of others that the regime thought was going to be a threat. When all of these things made headlines and where the Baha'i international community, which is an NGO with observer status at the United Nations, the Baha'i international community has a very good presence with the Human Rights Council, then lobbied all the different nations to try to get condemnation, a resolution to condemn the abuses against the Baha'is. And this resolution has passed almost without exception since the 80s. Nevertheless, the regime changed its tactics and said, okay, well, fine, if this is attracting too much attention, then we'll be more subtle about it. And maybe, you know, we'll continue to persecute people, but we'll do it in a less obvious way. That tactic has not worked because people are all too well aware of what goes on. So this is something that continues to draw a lot of attention, internationally speaking, and at the very highest levels because of this. It has mitigated to some extent the suffering, and I say only to some extent. And what I'm writing in my book is everything from the blatant and overt and the horrendous persecution all the way down to the most subtle. So how much, Gail, of the plot can you share with us to sort of entice us to read the book? So the book has a main character who is a woman physician named Ferishte. In order to give the context for what happens, the main action takes place between, say, 2008 and 2011. But there is a lot that leads up to that. And to build the case for character development and to show all of the other different things that gets to that point, I've started in 1955. And I start with a a real historic event that took place in a tiny village where there was a massacre of Baha'is. And from there, I introduce Ferishte and her family, and I introduce another family. Their last name is Rahimi. They are two different families. Basically, the families really have nothing to do with each other. But as years go by, these people become intertwined. And so this one other person from the Rahimi family, we follow him a little bit, and he's a boy about the same age as Ferishte back in 1955. He's basically a good kid and very different from his family. But as he grows up, circumstances push him into doing a whole lot of things that he really naturally would not do. And the same with Ferishte, because of the persecution of the Baha'is and her family in particular, it pushes her into a fearful sort of situation. She has a sister who is a very highly spiritually evolved person, whom Ferishte looks at as, oh, she's just a saint. And she resents her because she thinks, well, I can't be like her. And some terrible things happen to her sister. I won't give any spoilers on this. But this alters Ferishte's life, her entire life, and causes her to sort of hold back and to be a reluctant player within the Baha'i community. What I wanted to do here was to explore the idea that there can be reluctant heroes. People don't always get out there and say, I'm going to die for my faith. Some people do. But not everybody does. And I wanted to take a look at what the psychological and the spiritual process is with somebody who would just rather lead a quiet life and not be bothered, but is not allowed to. And the revolution later on, this is pushes Ferishte into some very, very uncomfortable territory. She becomes a doctor. And she uses her position 
to do things that many other people wouldn't do because she has a very strong sense of justice. And so she works to help women who are oppressed, women who are subjugated to domestic abuse. So she's trying to help people in that respect. And then she ends up helping a lot of prisoners as they are released from prison. They have terrible injuries, and these are not just Baha'is. She's helping anybody. And the idea here is addressing really this idea of constructive resilience. How do you, despite the fact that you're being persecuted in your own religious community, how can you simply take a stand for social justice and help the wider community? And so Farishte does not just help the Baha'is. She, what she does is she just helps whoever she can because she is in a position to do so as a physician. And this plays out post-revolution, and then it comes to the fore after the 2009 election, presidential election in Iran, when everything turned into chaos and violence, and there were some terrible things happen, and there's a turning point there. And what Farishte does, what her husband, who is also a physician, what he does and at that point, what this other guy, Rahimi, does. And then there is one one other character. I mean, there are a lot of characters. I have family trees. There are so many characters. <laughs> but there is another character who comes. He is a boy that is born in extreme poverty and terrible circumstances in the slums of South Tehran. And I look at him closely to show what can happen to a child that is neglected and abused and what that does to pervert his character. And he becomes a very bad actor. There is a confrontation between Farishte and him, which is, when I read a selection, it will have this guy in it, along with Farishte. But the idea is really to deal with social justice issues, to, to look at the oppression of a system that is just oppressing anybody who has any dissent, dissenting opinions, anybody who disagrees, women in particular, and giving carte blanche to abuse, I guess, is probably the best way of putting it. And the fact that Baha'is can be arrested at any time for any reason, under any pretext, and can be accused of anything at all, true or not. And that these people need to have a voice. So this book is really about giving those people a voice. And Gail, why did you title the book Crimson Ink? Well, at the very beginning of the book, there is a short quotation. And this is taken from the Baha'i writings. It's an allusion to the whole idea of dying for one's beliefs. In other words, you stand up for your beliefs, and if it costs you your life, that's what will happen. The quotation is, O oh, son of man, Write all that we have revealed unto thee with the ink of light upon the tablet of thy spirit. Should this not be in thy power, then make thine ink of the essence of thy heart. If this thou canst not do, then write with that crimson ink that hath been shed in my path. Sweeter indeed is this to me than all else, that its light may endure forever. So the crimson ink is basically one's blood that they shed for standing up for their faith. Yes. There's allusion to a, a lot of that in the book. I mean, there's not like that much in it, but there's background information to all of that in the book. So I guess this would be a good time, Gail, to read the excerpt that you have prepared. Okay. So this part of the book we're probably about oh three quarters of the way through the book here and Ferishte is a physician she's been treating she works in a private clinic because otherwise she would not be able to practice in the islamic republic as a baha'i she works in a private clinic and she can only see female patients she has a relative who ends up in her office this is the daughter of one of her cousins and these cousins are not Baha'is. 
not that that's relevant necessarily to this particular thing, but the idea I want to show is that Farish doesn't care. If you're a Baha'i, you're not a Baha'i. You're my patient, and I'm taking care of you. And in this situation, this relative of hers, this girl, her name is Niku, and she is married to this other guy that I mentioned earlier, the bad guy who was from the slums of South Tehran, and he has grown up to be a very unsavory guy, but he doesn't seem like that on the surface. Everybody thinks he's wonderful, but he's an extremely cruel man. And prior to this scene, Niku has a friend who finds her unconscious and in a very bad state and gets her into Ferishte's clinic because Niku has said, you can never take me to the hospital, I cannot go to a doctor, just get me to Ferishte because she trusts her. And so Niku brings her to Ferishte's office and she is in a mess and she really needs to be in an emergency room, but they save her life. We come into this scene where all of that transpires, which I've described. And then when they've got things calmed down, Ferishte is talking to this friend of Niku's. Her name is Marjan. They're going to try to decide what to do with Niku now. Niku's husband's name is Merdad. Okay, so this is the passage. They're trying to figure out where to send um, Niku now that she's been patched up. And uh, Marjan says, maybe I could drive her to her parents' house. Ferishte's face darkened. No, you can't take her there. Absolutely not. She reflected a moment, then said, take this. And she started writing down a telephone number. Still anxious about having taken Ferishte's office number from Niku, Marjan was in no mood to accept another number and told her so. Please, Marjan, take this. It's my private number, my cell phone. You may need it. When the young woman refused, saying she didn't want to be involved anymore, Ferishte said it out loud, telling her, okay, if you don't want to carry anything written on you, then just memorize it, please. And over Marjan's protests, Ferishte recited the number several times. Please, if you or Niku need me at any time, just call me. There was a low moan from the treatment table. Ferishte looked over at Niku, then back at Marjan. I can't stress enough how important it is for her to get care and follow-up treatment. And she can't stay here. We have to send her somewhere. Let's think. Their quandary was resolved unexpectedly. Shouting came down the corridor, and despite the efforts of the receptionist to prevent him, a man threw open the office door and came in, his castigations preceding him. Marjan jumped back, wishing she could melt into a corner or disappear beneath the floor. This was worse than Niku had ever intimated. For the moment, his focus was on Ferishte. He'd barely glanced at his wife on the table, but his voice wrenched her from sleep. Her eyes proclaimed raw terror, and her body tensed in an effort to... to what? Get up? Defend herself? Marijan's eyes found Niku's and pleaded for her to be silent. Nikuz sent Marjan's the same message. Hello, Merdad, said Ferishte. Her voice was mild. You? Yes. Why is my wife here? What have you done to her? Oh, you don't know. Well, I've just spent the last several hours putting her back together. She. What are you talking about? What have you done? Why is she all bandaged up? Why does she have a needle in her arm? Are you trying to poison her or something? I'm sure, Merida, that you know that it's not poison. She needs fluids. What? Are you saying she doesn't get water at home? Maybe you think I don't feed her either. Of course not. That's not. Or you put her to sleep, made her unconscious maybe. Why, huh? Why? What's she doing here anyway? She came in here with a lot of injuries, bleeding, broken ribs, and she would never come in here, never come to see you. I know what the family says about you. What do they say? Anything I don't already know? Come on. Why would she be here if she didn't need to be? She doesn't need to be. She doesn't need you. Why are you meddling in our affairs? Why are you sticking your nose into our business, huh? 
She was brought here instead of to a hospital, the place she really needs to be. She's got a lot of injury. What do you know? Stupid for an educated doctor. Ha! You're worthless. If I find out that you've hurt her, you'll pay for it, believe me. Merdad, I'm just trying to explain. What's to explain? You got your clutches on my wife, probably taking revenge on her for something her father said to you when you were kids. I don't know how you maneuvered this, but I'll find out. Be reasonable, Merdad. I... But seeing something in his eyes, Perishte shrugged and gave him a sad smile. Marjan, watching the entire encounter, saw his look of triumph. It was clear that he had entirely misread Ferishte's look. She wasn't capitulating, Marjan saw. She had recognized the man for what he was. And having given him the chance to prove himself capable of a more civilized level of interaction and finding him unequal to the task, she had decided to leave him to his own devices. He lived on his own planet with his own rules. He gave Ferishte a thin, severe smile. Then, turning his head at last, he noticed Marjan in the corner. You? You brought her here? He accused. He held her gaze for a minute, and Marjan could almost hear the wheels turning as he calculated how she could have managed that. He glanced over at his wife, whose swollen, wet eyes were sending her friend apologies. Looking back at Marajan, his gaze was hard. He held her eyes until she lowered them just to release herself. Niku opened her mouth. Her attempt said, I'm sorry, and please forgive me. Pitiful as they were, were met with her husband's emphatic, Hafesho! Shut up. A promise to deal with her later. Get a wheelchair. I'm taking her home. Before complying, Ferishte looked at him and said evenly, she's lost a great deal of blood. She's very weak. She actually should be in hospital. But if you don't want her to go, just be aware that she definitely needs follow-up treatment. With Niku now in the chair, he looked again at Ferishte. His eyes bored into hers, conveying I'm the one who decides here. Be warned. I won't forget that you saw this. As he pushed the wheelchair through the door and into the corridor, she simply said, Your baby's dead. For a second only, the man stopped, but didn't look around. Ferish, they stood in the doorway, looking at his back. He's dead. Just so you know, it was a son. Wow. So we just heard a reading by Gail Matsub from her novel Crimson Ink, which is quite a dramatic scene that we just heard. And Gail is a contemporary fiction writer who's lived in three continents and is fluent in several languages while working in the fields of healthcare, education, coaching, training, and community development, including NGO work. And her background and experience in multicultural environments, including the intimate settings of Persian family and community, provides her with unique insights into the complex issues she writes about. And as I just said, she's the author of Crimson Inc., and we just heard an excerpt from it. And she's currently working on its sequel. So I guess, Gail, my question is, this book in itself has a a beginning, a climax, and an end. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about what you have planned for the sequel. Yeah, I'm right in the middle of it right now. I had not intended to write a sequel, you know, when I finished this. And then there were things that began to come to the fore again in Iran with the situation with the Baha'is there and also just generally social justice issues throughout the country. I want to say I'm not Iranian, I'm American through and through, but I was married for 20 years. My first husband before he passed away was um, Iranian, so I was totally immersed in the culture, even though we never lived in Iran per se. But hearing and reading about all of the different things that were still going on, I thought, no, this story is not finished. And at the end of Crimson Ink, the story ends with Niku, the same one who is lying on this treatment table and being wheeled out at the end of the scene I just read. 
Niku kind of took over the story, and you have to read the book to find out why. And she is at the end. She is a person. She obviously she's been subjected to some terrible things, and she will find her courage. That's all I will say. She will find her courage, but she will also understand that being married to a person like this is a dangerous situation for her for the rest of her life. And she knows that there's no chance that she can get divorced. So she has to find a way to deal with that. And so the second book is centered on Niku. It sets in motion her her decision. I suppose I have to give a spoiler alert. Her decision will be to leave Iran. When she decides to do that, it in, ends up involving a lot of other people. It also involves lots of conversations with a cousin of hers who is related directly to Ferishte, that is one of her daughters, and also uh, to an aunt and uncle, also Ferishte's brother and his wife. And there are many, many other things that have happened in Crimson Ink where there are some, they're not loose ends per se, but it does leave you wondering about a few things. And I wanted to tie those things up. And so I end up doing that through Niku and her relationship with many other people in the family. And I take that book outside of Iran. So part of it takes place in Iran, but some parts of it are taking place outside Iran, notably Sweden and Switzerland and the United States, Turkey for a while as well, just to show a little bit about Again, constructive resilience to show what people can do through their own inner strength and through the example of other people who have inspired them to show what people can actually do to create a different reality for themselves. And that is what Niku does because Verishte has been her example. And so we just continue to deal with the social justice issues, the the situation with the Baha'is and the Baha'i Institute for Higher Education and how that has been impacted. So maybe, Gail, you can explain to folks what what is the Baha'i Institute of Higher Education, why it exists, and what it does for folks. Sure. So in the process of trying to disenfranchise the Baha'is in Iran, a plan was created to destroy the social, economic, cultural, and educational lives of the Baha'is within the country and outside the country to the extent possible. And there were many, many things that were done. And one of these was to deprive young people of a tertiary education. In some cases, kids couldn't even go to um, you know, elementary or high school, but basically most kids have been able to do that. But once they get out, getting any kind of higher level education has been impossible. And so the Baha'is decided, well, if we can't send them to universities, what we will do is we will volunteer those of us who have qualifications. We will volunteer and we will teach them university level courses. And that's what they did. And they called it the Baha'i Institution of Higher Education. Totally voluntary. It doesn't have a center or, you know, sort of a location. It's run out of people's homes by distance learning and and various other ways. What has happened is many, many graduates have come out of this program since 1987. The program has been recognized. The qualifications were so good from these students that they have been accepted by a number of universities, especially in the United States. There are a number of universities that will accept the students then they accept them for a graduate program. So it's been very successful, despite all the efforts of the Iranian regime to reduce it to nothing. They've raided the homes, they have destroyed computers, they have shredded materials, they have done everything they can to make it impossible for the Baha'is to educate their own young people. But somehow they continue on. Gail, when do you anticipate your sequel coming out? I've made good progress on it, all things considered. I would like to have it out by the middle of next year, if it's possible. Part of the the issue is that it has to be vetted because um, 
somebody has to just double check that I have been thorough in my research and have presented the faith in an accurate way. And so it goes through a vetting process to just make sure that everything is absolutely correct. Sort of like peer Uh, review. It's a peer review, yes. And so that can sometimes take time. For this book, for Crimson Ink, it took a very long time. But it was reviewed and it was considered completely in order the first time around. They did not ask me to make any changes. So I figured if I've done the research well enough the first time, I'm sure I can do it for this book as well. And hopefully it will take a shorter time. Well, I certainly uh, hope that's the case. It sounds like this is really important work to get out. So, Gail, I want to thank you so much for sharing this with us. This is uh, really quite an interesting story that you've put together here and quite intense. So thank you very much. <laughs> You're you. very, very welcome. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Gail Matsub, contemporary fiction writer and author of the novel Crimson Ink. You can find this interview and other interviews on the website of Bahaiperspective.com and on the YouTube channel of Baha'i Perspective. For information specifically on the Baha'i faith, you can go to the website baha'i.org or you can call the number 1-800-22-UNITE. I hope you join me next time on A Baha'i Perspective. I say I'm ashamed of mankind But I walk a thin line so I slip If something's in the way, yeah, I'm known to trip It's more than I can take All eyes on me and it's more than I can fake But at the end of the day, man, all that I can say is My prayers to the most great When I'm down for the count In it too deep when I live day to day Start to lose sleep when I don't go to class When I don't call fam back How long can I do this? How long will I last? I don't know God, I don't know If I am even worthy of your grace anymore I'm waiting for a sign But everything is a sign In reality the world is already mine I feel it in my veins, the fire When I cry out his name Oh my God Make my prayer a fire to burn away all my veils Make of my prayer a fire, a fire Kindle in my veins a fire, a fire My God, my adored one, my king, my desire I know that God gave each a purpose But we all gotta search way beneath the surface To find it, like trying to unearth a diamond That always appears with the most perfect timing So I start reading to find meaning And I see there is still something I am not seeing In between the lines, in my spirit, in the music In the very air that I'm breathing It's the reason I feel forced to write I recognize it inside me, that source of light Showing me that there is so much more to life Arming me with the fire because I got wars to fight I think about the breakers of the dawn And how they stood firm when the guns were drawn On the front lines, far from pawns Kings in their own right They're the ones who I call upon Whenever I lose faith I read the story of my name and realize It's never too late to believe And so shall my powers be I believed and he made a man out of me I feel it in my veins, the fire When I cry out his name Oh my God Make my prayer a fire to burn away all my veils. Make of my prayer a fire, a fire. Kindle in my veins a fire, a fire. My God, my adored one, my king, my desire. Now when the swords flash, go forward. When the shafts fly, press on. Yeah. Now when the swords flash, go forward. When the shafts fly, press on, press on. When the swords flash, go forward. Go when the shafts fly, press on, press on. When the swords flash, go full, go full. When the shafts fly, press on, press on.
time when the mystery tread the earth servant to all a candle of light weeping his life away drop by drop oh fettered bird in the cage of an alien world kindle his light In tears before thy face at the heavenly entrance of thy gate my His father calls a call to return to him the work is done and his family awaits they patiently wait for him beyond the veil and he yearns every day to take his flight my prayer Let the friends raise the call and carry the gift of love to the world. And the son of Baha has winged his flight. 